So now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Nicholas Boyon, Senior Vice President with Ipsos's Polling Division. Nick, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Alan, and uh, thanks to all of you who are joining this webinar informing and celebrating LGBT Plus Pride 2021. So um, I'm Nick Boyon. I'm speaking with you from New York, and I will be your host today as we unveil and discuss findings from our global survey on gender identity, sexual orientation, exposure and engagement with LGBT people, and attitudes towards LGBT visibility and equality. Then uh, for the remainder of, uh, of the hour, we will be holding a panel discussion about these findings. Uh, it'll be moderated by Oscar Ewan, who leads Strategy 3, uh, Ipsos's marketing brand and innovation consultancy, uh, who is also in New York. But uh, before we get going, I want to invite those of you listening in to submit questions via the question box, and we will do our best to answer them. We, uh, we also have uh, questions from some of you um, that were submitted in advance. So those questions that we don't get to today in this session will follow up separately afterwards. But now let's have a look at the findings from our global survey, which was conducted only about eight weeks ago on Global Advisor, which is uh, Ipsos's global online survey platform. We interviewed uh, more than 19,000 adults under the age of 75 from 27 countries. In about half of the countries, internet penetration is high enough to consider that the results are nationally representative. Elsewhere, online samples may skew a bit urban, affluent, or educated to uh, various uh, to various degrees, uh, and so should be should only reflect the views of the connected population. So, having said that, uh, let's start with the probably the most striking finding from the survey, which is a wide generation gap around gender identity and sexual attraction. So on average, uh, across the 27 countries that we surveyed, 4% in Generation Z, so that is those born in or after 1997, who are uh, up to age 24, 24 this year, 4% uh, of them on average globally identify as other than male or female, as opposed to 2% of millennials uh, who are between 25 and 40, and 1% uh, in Generation X uh, who are 41 to 56, and less than 1% among boomers who are older. So um, more specifically, 3% in Gen Z identify as non-binary, non-conforming, or gender fluid. 1% uh, as transgender, and 1% as uh, well, in another way, which actually rounds up to 4%. Now, in addition to that, we had 2% uh, in our survey on average globally who prefer not to identify uh, their gender identity. Um, now, in other generations, none of these categories exceeds uh, 1% on, on average. Uh, the, the numbers that we find in the US uh, are very much in line with the global average. Uh, they're a bit higher in Canada than, than the global average. Uh, one caveat here is that um, in most countries, uh, Gen Zers make up a relatively small proportion of the overall population, so the bases are, are small. So I um, just wanted to, to, to clarify that from the get-go. Um, we asked our respondents um, which uh, sex they were uh, attracted to, and on average, globally, among all adults, uh, all ages, 11% said that they are only, mostly, or equally attracted to people of their own sex. But with Gen Z, it's much higher. It's 18% uh, compared with 12% for millennials, 9% for Gen X, and 7% for boomers. Now, uh, of note, the proportions uh, in the US and Canada for Gen Zers and for Gen Xers are higher than, than average. Uh, globally, the difference between Gen Z and older generations is actually not so much in the proportion of, uh, of those who are only or mostly attracted to the same sex. Uh, it's in the proportion of those who are equally attracted to both 
you can see uh, here on this chart in orange, uh, it's the case of 10% of Gen Zers versus only 2% of baby boomers. Um, so that is really uh, a, a pretty st striking uh, difference. Uh, we also asked about our respondents' uh, sexual orientation, or the one that they identify with. And globally, 9% identify their sexual orientation with a label that's different from heterosexual. 80% identify as heterosexual uh, or straight, and 11% don't know or won't say. But uh, among Gen Zers, uh, we go to 18% identifying as something other than heterosexual uh, versus 10% among millennials, 7% Gen X, and 4% baby boomers. So again, we have a ratio of about 1 to 4 or 1 to 5 between boomers and Gen Z. Um, globally, Gen Zers are about twice as likely um, uh, as, as adults to identify as each of uh, of gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, omnisexual, asexual, or not to know or not uh, or not be willing to say. Uh, but in uh, in Canada, uh, it goes up to 26% uh, in our survey. In the US, we're at 19%, which is in line with the global average. Um, the, the, the difference maybe is that in the US and Canada, we see larger proportions of uh, Gen Xers and millennials identifying as something other than uh, heterosexual compared with the global average. Um, so that was the, the sort of the first finding. The, the second main finding here is how much the, the, the way people report their sexual attraction uh, or uh, orientation, how much it varies across countries. So here you see, um, the again, uh, sexual attraction by country. Um, Globally, 11% uh, say that they are only, mostly, or equally attracted to the same sex, but actually we have five countries where that percentage is 15% or more, uh, India, Australia, Brazil, Belgium, and, and Great Britain. And at the end, other end of the spectrum, um, in Russia, only 4% uh, say that. Uh, in the US, it's 13%, uh, and in Canada, it's also 13%. One, one thing that I would point out uh, is that um, in, uh, in a few countries, large proportions of respondents uh, preferred not to respond or said they did not know. So that was the case uh, in Malaysia, 25%, in India, 14%, in Japan, 13%, who uh, did, not, uh, did not provide a an answer uh, to this question. And it really speaks to the level of discomfort around this topic in those countries. Um, and then when it comes to uh, the sexual orientation that uh, people identify with, in fact, uh, the percentage of people who are unable or unwilling to define it um, is even higher uh, in, in some countries. In Malaysia, 39% would not identify it. In Turkey, 33%. In India, 24%. In Russia, 19. So these are the, the four countries where we where we really had the largest percentages of people who uh, were uncomfortable uh, responding to, to to the question. Now, identify uh, identification as uh, lesbian, gay, uh, or homosexual is uh, at an average of 3% globally, uh, and it is actually the percentage that we find in the US, uh, but it is higher, um, it, it is, it's highest actually in, uh, in Brazil, Spain, Australia, Canada, and the Netherlands at 5%. Uh, again, uh, the, the country where it is lowest is Russia, where fewer than 1%, actually it's uh, fewer than, less than one, than half of a percent uh, identified as such. Um, when it comes to uh, bisexuals, um, the, the incidence in our survey ranges from 9% in India and Brazil and Mex and uh, sorry, 9% in India, 7% in Brazil and Mexico to uh, only 1% in Turkey, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, in the US, it's 6%. 
So it's a little bit higher than the global average of four. Uh, and in Canada, it's the same as the global average. The, the options that we offered, um, as I mentioned earlier, included uh, labels such as pansexual, omnisexual, and asexual, or other. And um, the only country where we had more than 1% identifying as either uh, pansexual or omnisexual is the US. And actually, almost all those who did are uh, in Gen Z. I will... Uh, Mention also that we did not use the term queer uh, on purpose because it does not translate well in uh, many of the languages that we covered. So if uh, respondents in the US or, or in English language uh, countries were uh, only identified as such, they had the option of choosing other. Um, and uh, finally, uh, on the topic of uh, sexual orientation, um, we asked the 200 plus respondents uh, that we that identified as either transgender or non-binary, uh, non-gender conforming, gender fluid uh, across the world, uh, to tell us what how they define their own sexual orientation and what we found is a lot of diversity it's it's really uh very very it's 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 a wide range here it's all the colors of the rainbow uh which uh i think um was something that we had never uh, really explored before so i think that's kind of a novel piece of uh of information so the the third main point here is that um, more than reported sexual attraction or, or orientation, um, exposure to LGBT people and engagement with uh, the LGBT people in the LGBT plus community varies widely across countries. Uh, we see very, very significant differences. So on average, globally, four in 10 adults say that they have a relative, a friend, or a colleague who is lesbian, gay, or homosexual. So 42%. Um, one in four tell us that they have uh, someone close to them who is bisexual, and about one in 10 each one who is transgender, uh, and one who is non-binary or non-conforming or, or gender fluid. But again, um, in, when it comes to uh, knowing somebody who is gay or lesbian, um, in, um, in the US, the percentage is 57. Uh, so we have 57% in the US, 60% in Canada. It's, it's among the largest numbers in the world, but not the largest, uh, where we see the highest uh, is uh, in Brazil, in Chile, and, uh, and in Mexico at uh, 66 and 64 percent. But uh, in, uh, in Japan and in South Korea, it's only about one in 12. It's uh, 7 percent um, in, uh, in both cases. Um, so exposure to a bisexual person is less prevalent. We, we saw that uh, globally. Um, but again, it ranges from a high of 50% in Brazil to a low of 4% in Japan. In the US and Canada, it's around 30%. Uh, exposure to both transgender and non-binary, non-conforming or gender fluid people is actually most prevalent in Australia and Canada. Uh, and the US is not, uh, not too far behind. Um, one thing that struck me uh, when it comes to these findings is th how much the Americas, North and South, uh, and Australia stand out uh, relative, um, not just to Asia, but also to much of Europe when it comes to LGBT visibility. So there is something about the, the new world here that's, that stands out. Uh, we also looked at um, different forms of engagement with the LGBT community, and we found that uh, globally, on average, three in 10 say that they have spoken out against someone who is prejudiced against LGBT people. Uh, but again, it, it uh, varies uh, widely from a high of, um, of uh, 53% in Argentina to just uh, you know, 1% in, uh, in Japan. Um, two in 10 say that they have visited a bar or a nightclub 
that caters primarily to uh, to LGBT people, uh, and one in ten each say that they have attended a public event in support of LGBT people, such as uh, a Pride March, um, and uh, same same percentage, uh, so roughly the same uh, proportion, say that they have attended a same sex wedding. Now, uh, here in North America, we see that uh, the prevalence of uh, all these experiences is comparable to or just a little bit higher than the, the global average. So the, the fourth finding um, is that overall, people tend to be more supportive of than opposed to LGBT plus visibility. So on average, uh, globally, 51% support LGBT people being open about their sexual orientation or gender identity with everyone, uh, compared to just 16% who oppose it. So uh, it's a net difference that runs uh, up to 36 points. But again, there are huge differences across countries. Um, you know, with um, more than two thirds support uh, in Spain, Argentina, Chile, and less than 15% support in Russia and Malaysia. Uh, in, um, in, in the United States, the picture is fairly similar to the global average, a little bit more support, uh, 56%, but 16% opposition, so the, the net score is, is uh, plus 40. Canada is a little bit different. Uh, not only is it a little bit higher, it's higher than the U.S. and it's 10 points higher than the global average, but it's also the opposition in Canada is also, also much less prevalent. Only 8% uh, in Canada oppose um, you know, LGBT people being uh, open uh, in general. And so that's a net score of 53. Um, now, it's, uh, it's a pattern that we see over and over uh, on the LGBT visibility and equality. It's, a, it's probably a, the, the, the most, uh, the, the major difference that we see between Canada and the US uh, in, in this study. Uh, um, we also asked about uh, openly lesbian, gay, and bisexual athletes in sports teams. And the results here very much mirror um, the, 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 the picture uh, when it comes to LGBT people in general. So there is really not uh, any distinction between athletes and, and people in general. Um, and it's actually interesting that, you know, in the U.S. we have uh, uh, 36 points uh, in, uh, in favor of... Uh, of support, um, or it's a net score of 36 on this in the U.S., and uh, that kind of informs uh, the, the the response of the NFL and of uh, the, the Las Vegas Raiders when um, uh, Carl Nassib, uh, the, the the NFL player, came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was actually received quite positively. Um, we also looked at uh, support for LGBT people uh, displaying affection in public. And we see that support for that is more muted. Uh, globally, 37% uh, support it, uh, but we see 27% uh, who oppose it. So the, the net score globally is only 10 points. Um, the US again shows very similar uh, numbers when it comes to well, actually the same percentage of people in, in opposition, a little bit higher in support, so a net of plus 14. But again, Canada is much more uh, supportive of LGBT people displaying affection in public, such as kissing or holding hands, where we see uh, a net score of plus 34. Um, and we asked about uh, having more LGBT characters on TV and films and in advertising, and we see that the views uh, on, on this are very much the same uh, as they are um, about LGBT people displaying affection in public, almost, uh, almost the same numbers. Um, so this this brings us to the fifth main uh, main finding, the fifth and last main finding of of this survey, and it is that there is strong support, uh, 
in most countries, but not all, uh, for most forms of equality for LGBT plus people, but not all either. So uh, let me explain that. Um, the first country, to, we, we look at same-sex marriage first. And uh, so a little bit of background, the first country to legalize same-sex marriage uh, was the Netherlands back in 2001, 20 years ago. Um, then uh, Canada made it legal nationwide in 2005. Uh, here in the US, uh, the, the Supreme Court decision that made it the law of the land dates back from 2013, eight years ago. And so um, we wanted to have a look uh, at uh, where public opinion stands uh, around the world on this topic, we had actually covered it. We had asked exactly the same question back in 2013, uh, at the time only in 15 countries. We went back to the same 15 countries, by the way, so we have some trending there. So globally, we see that 54% support the right of LGBT people to marry legally, uh, full-fledged uh, marriage equality. 16% uh, uh, say that same-sex couples should be allowed to obtain some kind of legal recognition but not to marry. So combined, this make up 69% uh, of, uh, of the public globally on, on average. Uh, Full-fledged opposition to any kind of legal recognition globally is also at 16%, and then we had 15% who were not sure. Now, um, in, in most countries, uh, we, have, we have 23 out of the 27 countries with either a full majority or a plurality in support of marriage equality. Uh, in fact, the only country uh, with, well, the, the only two countries with a clear majority in favor of marriage equality where it's not in the books today. And you can see on the right-hand side, the dots I kind of mention the, the current legal status in the various countries. Um, so among all of the countries where a full-fledged majority is in favor of uh, full marriage equality, um, the only two that have not passed it yet are Italy, um, which recognizes uh, civil partnership, but not, uh, not marriage, and Chile. Uh, but actually in Chile, the parliament uh, is currently working on a bill to, to allow it. So there's a actually a lot of consistency between uh, majority support and uh, current legal status. Now, there are two countries in the survey where uh, full majorities are against any kind of legal recognition, and these are uh, Russia and Malaysia. And of course, uh, same-sex marriage is not an option in, in these countries. Uh, compared to our 2013 survey in 15 countries, we've seen uh, no uh, drop in the level of support for same-sex marriage uh, anywhere. Um, and we've actually seen uh, very large increases in a number of countries, including Argentina, the US, Hungary, uh, where it's actually now a plurality, uh, despite um, the, the, the laws that are being, uh, uh, that recently passed over there, uh, Japan and, and Italy. Now, um, we asked similar questions uh, both this year and back in 2013 about uh, same-sex couples' right to adopt children, and the results are very similar. Um, we asked about uh, laws banning discrimination against LGBT people, uh, you know, when it comes to employment, access to education or housing or social services. Um, majorities in 21 of the 27 countries are in favor of such laws. On average, 55% uh, uh, of the public globally support them. Only 19% oppose uh, these laws. So again, a difference of 36 points. But uh, this said, um, in several countries, only between one quarter and one third of adults are supportive of these laws. And these countries are Russia, Malaysia, Turkey, and Hungary. Um, the the uh, other thing that we asked about pertaining to equality is uh, whether you support or oppose companies and brands that actively promote equality for LGBT people. 
The results there are very similar to those about uh, support, about laws banning uh, discrimination. They're a little bit more muted, um, but uh, generally we see the, the same kind of uh, the same kind of pattern. Globally, 47% in favor or supporting companies um, and brands that are really are active uh, for this for this cause. Uh, versus only 19% uh, against. So globally, we see a net score of, tw of plus 27. In the US, plus 28. And in Canada, once again, a higher score at 42. So uh, the, the, the caveat here, or I would say the, the one area where we see uh, public opinion uh, not being uh, as supportive of uh, certain rights is uh, when it comes to allowing transgender athletes to perform according to the gender they identify with. On average, globally, and I, I don't know if you can see this or I may have actually, oh, I'm, I apologize. I think I must have pressed on the wrong button. I don't know if you can see the... You're good there, Nick. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, here you see 32% of the public globally um, support uh, transgender athletes performing uh, based on the gender they identify with, and an equal percentage uh, oppose it. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the net score is minus one uh, due to rounding. But uh, in certain countries, and um, surprisingly, the, the, the not just uh, the most socially conservative countries, but actually the U.S. is one of the countries where uh, we, where it is the most the case. Um, there is uh, a great deal of opposition. So in the U.S., 45% oppose. Uh, the idea of transgender athletes competing based on the gender they identify with compared to 27% in favor, a 19-point difference. And, um, you know, for background, a, a number of states, uh, including Texas and Florida, have recently passed laws that ban uh, transgender athletes from uh, competing in school sports that match their identity. Uh, and then California, I think yesterday or two days ago, um, actually banned uh, travel by its officials to, to those states. So it's a very hot issue here in the U.S., and we will definitely keep monitoring public opinion on this. So this uh, kind of wraps up um, the, the review of, uh, of these findings. I will... Um, I, I, I'm showing you here uh, a recap of uh, the key findings of the survey, and uh, I invite you to look for the full report uh, on Ipsos.com. You have the, the URL here. Um, you can uh, download um, a report with even more data on it, and I will be happy to address any questions that you may have on it. And now I will pass the floor to our panel and let my colleague Oscar introduce our panelists. Fantastic, thank you so much, Nick. Such great insights. Um, really interesting foundation on, I think, uh, where we can build a rich discussion with our panelists today. And we have a rich, uh, really great set of panelists today from the private sector, from an NGO perspective, and an academic perspective as well. I see their cameras popping up. Hello, guys. Um, let me introduce them now. So first, we have Jessica Ryder. She's the Director of Brand Marketing Insights and Strategy at e j Gala Winery, the largest winery in the world and a top spirits producer with over 100 brands in their portfolio, including La Marca, New Amsterdam Vodka, High Noon Sun Sips, and Barefoot, the number one selling wine in the world. More importantly, for the last eight years, Gallo has earned a 100% score on the Human Rights Campaign Foundation Corporate Equality Index and recognized as a best place to work for LGBTQ equality. So that's great news. Prior to joining Gallo, Jessica held many research and strategy consulting positions on the agency side, guiding innovation and brand development strategies in a wide range of sectors. So thank you and welcome, Jessica. Um, next, we have Marianne Balfour. She's an economist at the Directorate for Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs of the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. She's headquartered in Paris, uh, where she leads the OECD's work in the inclusion of lesbian, gay, 
bisexual, transgender, and intersex people. Her recent work identifies the laws and policies that are essential to foster LGBTI plus equality and to what extent those laws exist across OECD member countries. So she's also a research professor at the Paris School of Economics and at Paris-Panthéon-Sorbonne University. She is a graduate of HSA Paris and holds a doctorate from the École Polytechnique. Thank you very much, Marianne, and welcome. And then finally, we have Andrew Flores. He is a visiting scholar at the Williams Institute of the UCLA School of Law and an associate professor of government at American University. His research focuses on attitude formation, attitude change, and public policies affecting LGBTQ populations and has appeared in the American Journal of Public Health, Public Opinion Quarterly, Political Psychology, and other peer-reviewed journals. His most recent work, which is interesting, is uh, with the Williams Institute, examines the impact of COVID-19 on LGBTQ communities. So well, again, welcome and thank you all for joining us today. Um, and then again, those of you joining us on the webinar, feel free to drop questions into the question box. We'll try to get to them as well. But where I want to start, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Jessica, is you know, looking at the data that Nick presented, what did you find interesting or surprising? I know you've been working in this space for a long time. Um, did anything surprise you? Um, first, thank you for inviting me to speak on this topic. I really appreciate it, and it's a delight to be here. Um, when I reviewed the data, um, I don't know that I would consider this surprising, but certainly insightful and worth pointing out. Um, noticing that we saw relatively low percentage of um, of people supporting LGBT visibility and representation in TV advertising, et cetera. Um, the caution that I would offer to this audience and this group is that while um, we have seen increasing um, uh, support for LGBT visibility, though the number was low in um, TV ads, et cetera, um, I wouldn't take this to mean that it's less important. Um, I would look at this as really a small disconnect or, or an important disconnect between social acceptance and true understanding of what it means for representation. And I think that representation really truly matters in so many ways beyond just who and what shows up in our advertising and in our communication. And we should be thinking about as marketers and insights people and, and business professionals about how to weave and, and have representation end to end in the way we do business. So whether it is um, the people who are making our products, who are selling and marketing them, as well as who shows up in, in our advertising. You know, that, that's so interesting. It is, um, I know we have a lot of marketers from great companies on this, on this webinar. And sometimes I think it is a little bit up to us to kind of push the envelope a little bit, right? If you're always waiting for the public opinion and the surveys and um, all, all of all of the public opinion to catch up to where we are, I don't think we'd move very quickly. And so if you think about things, and when I started my career, I worked on Absolute Vodka as a brand. And I remember you you, you really want to push the envelope a little bit, um, even, before, even before public opinion is there, right? You think about some of the early media things that happened, whether it was with Queer as Folk or um, Will and Grace. Um, you, I think we, those of us on this call, maybe have an opportunity to actually kind of shape the conversation a little bit. I think you're so right. Brands have a responsibility um, and we need to acknowledge that we are a part of culture and can shape and create that momentum. And, and so much of this is about, um, in my perspective, what kind of world do we want to live in and what influence can we have as business people, but humans yeah. in this world to, to advance and push us further along that path towards that world that we want to be in. Exactly. It's funny when, you know, when you're, when you're flying and someone says they're a doctor on board, I never think I can do anything, but there are realms in which we can actually um, shape, um, shape our society a little bit. Marianne, what did you find um, interesting or surprising? You, you have a much more global perspective um, sitting in Paris. Was, was there anything that, that, uh, that surprised you in what Nick shared? Yeah, um, there are two, two findings that struck me, uh, and both of them confirm that businesses can no longer treat LGBTI inclusion as a marginal issue that uh, they can ignore. Um, the first striking findings relates to the share of individuals who 
do not self-identify as heterosexual and who do not define their gender identity exclusively based on their sex at birth either. And this share is very large, uh, especially among the younger generations. And complementary sources that we present in our own work at the OECD show that this share is on the rise. More and more people self-identify as LGBT over time, which is a phenomenon, again, driven by uh, younger cohorts. Um, the second finding that struck me is that there is strong support for LGBT equality and that this support is globally, again, on the rise. Um, this positive trend in social acceptance of LGBT people is very consistent with one of the trends that we document in our own work at the OECD, which is the fact that laws critical to ensure equal treatment of LGBT people are increasingly adopted. Uh, just to illustrate this trend, uh, same-sex marriage was legal in 20 OECD countries in 2019, while no OECD country was allowing same-sex partners to marry 20 years ago in 1999. So yeah. this increase in social acceptance of LGBT people that you document uh, shows that um, the fact that businesses publicize their commitment to LGBT equality is less and less risky. Uh, it's less and less likely to alienate at least some segments of their consumers. And in fact, quite the contrary, uh, there is a lot more support than opposition towards corporate activism uh, for LGBT equality. And, 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 and Andrew, maybe I'll jump to this, this, this question for you, I guess, is and of course you can answer what you think is interesting about the data as well, but um, wh why that shift, so, why is it so fast? I mean, we that live it may not think it's fast, but in the kind of arc of history, that's extremely fast, right? If you think about when in the US they signed the Emancipation Proclamation to free the slaves and when until the Voting Rights Act it was almost a hundred years, right? And and I, 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 I struggle to think of any other I don't know, movements that, that has happened so fast? What, what's driving that and how did this, how did this happen? How did we, I, I hesitate to say we got lucky, but how, how did this happen so, so quickly? Thanks for the question. Um, and I will, uh, of course, want to speak also to uh, fascinating yeah. findings overall. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but you're asking kind of the question that has puzzled a lot of social scientists um, recently. Uh, because, as you know, uh, uh, attitudes don't necessarily change. Public opinion tends to be rather stable on a lot of different measures. Um, and, and as such, the question has been, what's driving this? Because if you think about traditional attitude change, normally the idea is that there's generational replacement. Basically, older individuals who have a different set of values uh, uh, are no longer part of society, and younger generations tend to come in and like uh, <laughs> right, and and they, and they ca carry a different set of values. And and as you see, there are different generational divides across the globe about self-identification. And I'm sure you'll find in your data that there are generational divisions in terms of how people come to form their attitudes, say around marriage equality and other topics, right? And so if you actually just looked at the data and said, okay, if we knew that generational replacement would lead to these shifts in public opinion, um, do what we observe in terms of the trends right now, are they consistent with that gradual change? And the answer is no, right? Yeah. So this means that not only is it that there are new people entering into adulthood and entering into the uh, uh, age of majority to decide on public policy, but then it's also because people are just changing their minds. So what leads to this change of minds? What changing of hearts and minds? Um, and, uh, and there's a few things. Uh, one, of course, is visibility. Um, uh, you know, going back to just the uh, Harvey Milk and what he would say about you know the role of just coming out, right? And that and acknowledging that we are everywhere as LGBTQ people, right? Uh, and uh, a consistent and constant finding uh, in the studies of prejudice is the way in which knowing and interacting with people who are not like you, so interacting and knowing someone who's LGBTQ, ends up becoming a large correlate um, and potential driver for positive attitude change, right? But this is also going back to Jessica's comment, well, what leads people to want to come out? What, may, uh, what encourages people to identify, say, not as uh, heterosexual or cisgender, but then also to tell other people? And part of that is cultural, right? And this is where brand and representation also matter, because having that visibility on, t on TV, uh, on social media, encourages people to self-identify, but also to, to tell other people. And that increases the number of people who know someone who's LGBT, which also can lead to this positive shift and change. Um, some of my colleagues have actually written books just on the role of just LGBT characters on TV 
and how, how that increase, that representation increase, correlates very, very strongly with the number of percent of the public, in the U.S. at least, who say they know someone who is LGBT. And so we're seeing this like uh, uh, um, groundswell of increased exposure and increased identification. And so, um, and so when you think about what public policy and attitude changes in public opinion, we do have to think about what's going on in the broader society and culture. Um, and, and globally, there have been studies that show that uh, areas that have more diverse, say, television entertainment, where you get more, more Western media that might have more LGBT content, that a public opinion at the country level tends to correspond with the amount of, say, media diversity that might be within a certain area. So that's really fast. So that's one thing. The other thing that I'll say um, is that the real role that public policy and legal inclusion of LGBT people does lead to this positive shift in public opinion. They call this policy feedback. So we normally think of uh, public opinion as kind of driving policy, right? That normally society has to get to a certain degree before, say, states have marriage equality. Your data show this as well in terms of how well public opinion and public policy kind of match one another, right? Uh, but there's been studies to show that by virtue of, say, passing marriage equality, you actually do uh, move who might have been opposed to uh, marriage equality to actually become more favorable to it. Um, and, they, and they've done this both with explicit public opinion measures, but even when it comes to, say, implicit biases, so from, like underlying prejudices, there have been studies that show that after passing, say, marriage equality in the United States, people not just had a, a change in their explicit prejudice, but also in these implicit measures. So there is a definite role for both cultural components, but the legal components that kind of kind of structure the changes that we see in public opinion. No, and we saw that in, in, in Nick's data, right? So the countries that passed marriage equality first tended to have higher acceptance of marriage equality, right? So it is kind of that they, they support and push each other. So that's um, su super important. Yes. Now, going back and then to, I'll just, I'll just, can I just please. add the one thing for the fascinating thing? Uh, so yeah. the fascinating thing for me in the data, it's, uh, it's been touched on a little bit, was just this, um, the comfort with visibility. Um, and to me, the passing component was this, is that you had uh, clear majorities across a number of these measures where it's either they support it or there's this ambivalence. It's not necessarily that they're high, uh, extremely opposed to LGBT representation. And to me, that smaller slice of the society that might be opposed to visibility as opposed to just talking about it, I think is an important note, right? Because that brands can uh, uh, market and have LGBT representation. And they're not necessarily like, uh, um, uh, uh, um, offending, say, a huge portion of the society uh, by by the virtue of being of having that representation, right? It was only what ten percent who are opposed to having some type of LGBT representation uh, on some of these measures. So, uh, so I think that's an important note. There is that the intensity of opposition is not doesn't seem to be as large. One of the things I love that you said, Andrew, um, when I think about the roles and responsibilities of, of marketers is knowing that even that um, extreme negative or the, the those that oppose, everything you just described says that public opinion isn't a static thing, right? Like it is something that can be influenced and just exposure and, and um, having that visibility out there can actually shift people's perceptions. And so even though uh, I, we know there are companies in general are tend to be very conservatively minded and often more worried about those that they're going to offend than um, the other side of the equation. But recognizing that even in the actions that we take as business people or humans in, in general can uh, start to diminish that extreme negative over time. And in this instance, as you just described, it's, it's happening more quickly than in any other way that we've seen before is I think like, an awesome thing that gives me so much hope and optimism for, for, you know, for, for change in the future. I, I, I love what you said about, you know, it, it's, it's against fighting the people it's, you have to value the people that are opposing. And I, and I guess you, Jessica, since you've been in so many of these decision boardrooms where they're making decisions on, okay, do we do these marketing campaigns? What is the, what are those conversations like? Like what do the people that oppose it say and how do we trigger that conversation and how do we kind of bring this, to the front, because I imagine a lot of the people who are joining us today are, are, are sitting in, you know, marketing decisions, um, positions where they're saying, well, you know, should we do a special campaign? You know, should we celebrate? What, 
what are those conversations like and how do we how do we have those conversations, I guess? And then similar for you, Marianne, you know, I'm sure there's the same decisions on the on the employment front, right? Do we pass these um, these equality do we do we pass these non non-discrimination laws? Like what, what are those conversations like and how do we how do we have them? I guess maybe Jessica, you you wanna start there? Yeah, you know, these, these, you're right. These conversations are happening all the time. And, um, you know, in, in companies like Gallo that have, of course, our, our corporate entity as well as individual brand brand identity and, and, and decisions, um, that can even add a layer of kind of complexity and interest in, in these conversations. But what I would say to, to um, marketers and business people is really to, to be brave and courageous about what, what we want to do here, I, you know, a lot of the conversation tends to be there, there is fear of misstep or fear of doing something wrong. Um, and, and um, you know, when I think about what might be underlying those concerns is um, back to Andrew's comment around um, exposure and, and visibility. Uh, to me, that, that underscores the potential disconnect at times between the people who are making some of these decisions and mm. the communities with which we want to reach. And so as, um, you know, as an insights professional, I am constantly trying to bring both the intersection of data, uh, hard data and, and empathy, which would be more I don't know, a heart connection to, you know, or, or a familiarity um, and exposure to these different populations that, that we care about or we're interested in marketing towards. And so you, you can't just rely on the data, otherwise you will be so behind the times. Um, and and um, so the more that we can bring that empathy into the equation and, and uh, uh, encourage that, that connection or familiarity and exposure am amongst the decision makers to be brave and to um, recognize and appreciate the changing headwinds of culture, the, the, the better we can get where we need to go. And so, and so Marianne, to you, um, how do we get companies to have the same conversation, right? How do we get all companies to be as progressive as Gallo, which is lucky enough to work? Um, you know, what's, what's missing and what needs to happen? What needs to happen next for those of us that are on the call that might be able to have a chance to influence some of those discussions? So, uh, in terms of uh, of marketing, of pride advertising, I think it's very important to to speak a universal uh, language, uh, which means that rather than focusing on issues that are too specific to LGBTI people, uh, you should concentrate on the issues of broader interest to the general public, such mm -hmm. as uh, values that both LGBT and non-LGBT people uh, hold dear in their everyday life and that they are willing to to fight for. And this seems to basically be the best up. way to connect yeah. uh, non-LGBT people with messages of inclusion. Um, in the workplace, uh, so we know that we are still very far from LGBT equality, uh, despite a clear causal relationship between LGBT inclusion in the workplace and business economic performance. Uh, we have plenty of evidence that shows that discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, sex characteristics is still very widespread. Uh, so it's very urgent to take action, and I think it's important to to try to proceed stepwise so as to ensure uh, support from all stakeholders. So the first step is to try to publicize employers' commitments to not discriminate, uh, to publicize the commitment that uh, they will recruit staff and extend to each individual the same benefits, salaries, opportunities for training or promotion, uh, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, and so on. And this can be done by signing uh, charter, charters or declarations, such as the Declaration of Amsterdam that was created by uh, Workplace Pride uh, in Europe. Uh, for this commitment to be viewed as real, uh, it should, I think, be very regularly demonstrated by the executive leadership of the firm um, in the framework of both internal and external events. It's also mm -hmm. very important to, to clearly explain um, this commitment to the different levels of management so that man managers become allies. It's very important that they understand that including everyone, valuing everyone is the best way to operate a business because it drives performance. Um, and managers, I think, here should be equipped, should be given advice on handling 
the challenging conversations you were uh, referring to with coworkers and clients who express discomfort with interacting with LGBT people. For instance, in order to address to address the discomfort um, that a colleague that who transitions to to the other gender may cause among the staff, uh, managers should recall uh, the importance of treating this person with the same level of respect than that is shown um, uh, to the rest of the of the team. And the manager should also stress uh, the courage that it takes for transgender people to live authentically as themselves. And this commitment to LGBT inclusion should be also widely communicated to new hires, to new recruits, uh, for yeah. instance, during induction programs, um, because on top of informing the new staff of the standards of conduct uh, they are expected to comply with, uh, this strategy also allows to uh, allows lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex uh, new recruits to feel welcome and and valued. So all yeah. these steps are extremely important in order to start building a very uh, inclusive uh, environment uh, in the workplace. Uh, I, I I I hear this this thread that's coming through this discussion about it. So it's a responsibility of all of us to really push forward, and it's not. You know, we're back away for the data or the public opinion to catch up, but it's also us, up, us to, up to us to, to to move things forward. And, and can, again, I, can I add a comment about that? You, you know, um, one thing that I'm sure many of the people listening can relate to in their own professional lives, like you know, so at at Gallo, it's incredible. We've got employee resource groups that are about um, supporting and celebrating different communities um, within Gallo, which is which is wonderful. And we have a lot of um, very rich conversations about diversity and inclusion at, you know, in, in all the ways across the organization. But one thing that we've really been um, uh, thinking and talking a lot about is um, how to in, internalize this behavior and, and, and these values across the board and that it is not a um, a separate committee or one person's job like you can't you can't kind of outsource this and and that that can be um, you know when you are uh, uh, you know when when you are learning a new you know learning something new that might be your inclination is to hire that out or to, to outsource it and that might accelerate um, uh, uh, fluency in, in some ways in, in the very short term but we can't other, you know, outsource or other the ownership of, of this. It really has to be embedded in in um, everything we do and thinking about, you know, just one small build on what um, Marianne was was saying is really understanding um, uh, the courageousness and bravery that that it that it takes, even as social acceptability has been increasing. Um, the reality is that there still isms across the board that um, uh, these communities are faced with every day. And, and even at, you know, with that increasing acceptance, it doesn't mean that um, it, what I'm trying to say is we can normalize without diminishing. And sometimes um, that there is this um, bias towards diminishing the experience in order to create the illusion that like, Everything's cool and good. and uh, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I would. Good message. I would add that. Um, yeah, that you do see in terms of the public opinion polling that you know attitudes are different for different segments of say the LGBTQ community, um, and so that yeah. So even if you have a inclusive environment, it may not be inclusive of all the varieties of sexualities and genders that you may encounter. Um, and so, and I, I do appreciate Jessica's comment about what does inclusion look like, and it's not just like. Uh, smoothing over differences, it's also appreciating difference and what that difference and diversity will do in terms of your your workforce, in terms of your employee morale and things like that. Uh, my only other uh, uh, comment here is that it's great to think about this programmatically as the as an entire everyone all hands on deck. Uh, because it's really easy for someone who, say, is a minority employee, and I can speak from uh, an academic perspective, to have that diversity equity committee, uh, and then to put them into this committee, and then the committee has almost no uh, ability to actually effectuate structural changes that would actually benefit the workforce. And that can lead to employee burnout, low morale, and a lot more turnover. So it's, an, so it's important to think about what does inclusion mean, and how does that get actually carried out in a programmatic way. We're getting a lot of questions into the question box, but there's one that I think is is both provocative and um, ties together a lot of what we've been the discussion we've been having around 
pushing the envelope around um, broadening our, our scope of what we see as LGBT plus. Um, and, and it's about trans athletes. So this is an interesting one. And maybe Andrew, you talk about this since you're the public opinion experts. The one, the only point in which the US was less tolerant or accepting than the global average was this point around uh, accepting trans athletes in our sports. Um, any, any thoughts or theories on, on why we're generally progressive except in the sports arena? Well, uh, I mean, you're right, Oscar, in thinking like looking at what's going on in the United States right now um, around state policies, around say trans youth and athletics and sports participation. Um, uh, uh, it's not just a random fact that these states are proposing these policies. Uh, these states are proposing these policies. It's a coordinated effort. Um, actually, uh, there's a there's an event that happens in D.C. Uh, it was all virtual, but the last year there was the Value Voter Summit, and there were a whole section sections of that of that convention that was dedicated to talking about transgender athletes and how they're going to pursue policies to say ban transgender uh, athletes from participating in sports based on their current gender. Now, uh, why is that the case? Or, well, part of that is because the public uh, public attitudes are at this kind of uh, position where they're kind of against uh, uh, these issues. And why? Uh, this has been a question that myself and others have been trying to examine now. Uh, there is this question of fairness that kind of gets put out there. Uh, there are some people who think that transgender people participating in athletics based upon their gender somehow creates an imbalance in terms of physical abilities um, and that it would ruin, say, sports competition. And there is, again, further discussion and focus on, say, how this might affect women and girls, which is always the case when you think about um, uh, discussions around the rights of transgender people. This was similar to the discussions that happened around uh, bathrooms and public accommodations, is, you know, what happens when you have a transgender woman go into a woman's restroom? And the answer is that the data kind of show they just use the restroom. <laughs> um, there's no kind of correlation between that and, and say, the violence Anything. that people, <laughs> the, the scare tactics that get put out there, right? Um, and so that's the same thing that's gonna be happening here is that there's a lot of public misunderstanding and lack of familiarity. And when it comes to those kinds of questions, people really easily can jump to a conclusion that would say, oh, well, I'm not in favor of that, right? Uh, they don't fully understand the question. And so then the question is, well, how do you change people's minds? How do you inform the public? And there you have to think about kind of the stories that you tell. Again, it's branding or uh, marketing. It's also like the, the narratives. Um, and there was a recent um, documentary about transgender athletes um, that's uh, called Changing the Game. And it's trying to tell those stories, those real stories that kind of put um, a human face on trans athletes as opposed to this kind of uh, 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 scarier thing or somehow uh, uh, out there. Um, and so it is, it is a constant uh, uh, struggle. And I would say that even if you look at, say, the natural sciences and research and say, uh, answering the question, is there a kind of a a lack of competitiveness when you're inclusive of trans people, that there are some, some studies and some findings that kind of say, well, there might be some cases where trans athletes might be at an advantage, but then there are numerous other cases where trans athletes may be at a disadvantage. And sure. so also trying to think about kind of, it's not a simple policy question, but it's not a simple policy problem. So it's one that you need to get lots of heads together to kind of figure out. Um, yeah. But so that's where, that's where we are right now. Um, and so people are trying to figure out how to, reach the public on these pressing issues. Yeah, I was going to say, well, the U.S. is a bit crazy about sport, but definitely Marianne probably knows, I, I know France, just having spoken to some colleagues about last night in Switzerland, uh, I know France is crazy about sport <laughs> as well. But, um, we, we are just one minute over the hour, so I'm going to um, thank you all for joining us today, um, Andrew, Jessica, and Marianne, as well as those of us that joined us on the webinar. I think it's a, a wonderful way to connect as we come to close of Gay Pride Month and we can all rest a little bit maybe. Um, and also a reminder of how we might carry forward the kind of energy, commitment, um, and love beyond this month, but uh, throughout the entire year. So I want to thank you all and thank you all for joining us today. Ellen? That was wonderful. Thank you, guys. Um, I want to remind everyone that you will be receiving a link to today's recording um, probably in the next 24 to 48 hours, so be on the lookout for that. And of course, if you have any more questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us directly.
Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.